Last winter, the FBI was praised for its speed in cracking the case of the World Trade Center bombing and bringing four suspects to trial. Now, there is some evidence that the FBI may have known of the plot in advance through an informant and might, might even have stopped the bombing that killed six people. Correspondent Jacqueline Adams has the story. FBI agents might have been able to prevent last February's deadly explosion at New York's World Trade Center. They discussed secretly substituting harmless powder for the explosives, but they didn't, according to the FBI's own informant, Imad Salem. Unbeknownst to the FBI at the time, Salem recorded many of his conversations with his handlers. I'm holding 903 pages of draft transcripts. William Kunzler represents Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman and several others charged with conspiring to blow up a series of New York City landmarks four months after the World Trade Center bombing. That case has not yet gone to trial. Kunzler confirmed newspaper reports of the Salem transcripts. In one, Salem complains to an FBI agent, since the bomb went off, I feel terrible, I feel bad, I feel here is people who don't listen. The agent replies, hey, I mean, it wasn't like you didn't try and I didn't try. You can't force people to do the right thing. There is material in here to show gross governmental misconduct. Today, attorneys for the defendants in the ongoing World Trade Center bombing case formally asked for the transcripts of Salem's tapes. Quite frankly, beyond me, why uh, now the fourth week into the trial... Uh, we still don't have these materials. Prosecutors have refused to comment publicly, but legal experts say the defense may have no right to those transcripts. It's not a defense to a crime to say, if only the government had stopped me, I wouldn't have done it. So this isn't material that ordinarily the defense would be entitled to. In court today, a witness from the Ford Motor Company linked debris recovered from the explosion site to a Ford van where defendant Mohammed Salama was arrested less than a week after the bombing. Jacqueline Adams, CBS News, New York. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so glad uh, that you could join us today for this Wednesday, July 25th, 2001 broadcast. Tyranny is enveloping the globe, and the United States is a shining jewel the globalists want to bring down, and they will use terrorism as the pretext to get it done. So that's coming up in the second half of the show. Very important information. I'm going to put the call out that you call the White House and tell them, look, we've seen the news stories that you've wanted to blow things up, that you have blown things up, and that you're saying that four million of us are going to die and we need martial law and the Associated Press at one of your little drills you had, and that we're aware of who the terrorists are if you pull this. This can stop this Hitlerian Reichstag event. I want to put the toll-free number up for Congress. And I won't want you to believe Alex Jones. I want you to go get these news stories off my website. I want you to call these major newspapers. I want you to find out these statements were true by the White House about preparing for martial law. And I want you to let them know that if there is any terrorism, we know who to blame. The point is, if any terrorism comes, it's from this government. And if there was an outside threat like a bin Laden who was a known CIA asset in the 80s running the Mujahideen War and whose family builds all the military bases over in Saudi Arabia right now and sits on the board of Iridium Satellite, he's the boogeyman they need in this Orwellian phony system. Boy, you're in a lot of trouble, and so are we. And, but we got to speak out, and it's the only thing we can do. All right, let's go to the FEMA piece and maybe something else. I want to take a break. We'll come back in the last uh, 12 minutes or so, and I promise go to your calls. Uh, just uh, and, and, and I want the White House numbers up there now. A big part of this solution, after you research all the government terrorism and check out what I'm saying is true, call the White House and tell them, we know the government's planning terrorism. We know Oklahoma City and World Trade Center was terrorism. We know the Joint Chiefs of Staff wanted to blow up airliners, Baltimore Sun. If you do it, we're going to blame you because we know who's up to it. Or if you let some terrorist group do it, like the World Trade Center, we know who to blame. And you could save the planet. I'm calling it Operation Expose the Government Terrorist. Because now they're going from killing 160 people at Oklahoma City and 81 at Waco and a couple dozen injuring a 1,000 at the World Trade Center to saying one to four million. Associated Press. There's the White House number. Your faxes are really important. And there's the Capitol Hill switchboard for your congressman. We're going to leave that up throughout the FEMA broadcast. 
We'll be right back with your calls. Thank you for staying with us. Arthur Bush, when George W. Bush took office in 2000, he brought with him Vice President Dick Cheney, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, and Deputy Secretary for Defense Paul Wolfowitz, all of whom had served together previously in the administrations of Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush. Paul Wolfowitz, in particular, had long been recognized as the intellectual force behind a radical neoconservative fringe of the Republican Party. For years, Wolfowitz had been advancing the idea that the United States should reconsider its commitments to international treaties, international law, and multilateral organizations such as the United Nations. A radical plan for American military domination first surfaced during the administration of George H.W. Bush. In 1992, Paul Wolfowitz, working in the Department of Defense, was asked to write the first draft of a new national security strategy, a document entitled The Defense Planning Guidance. The most controversial elements of what would later come to be known as the Wolfowitz Doctrine were that the United States should dramatically increase defense spending, that it should be willing to take preemptive military action, and that it should be willing to use military force unilaterally with or without allies. This new reliance on military force was necessary, according to Wolfowitz, to prevent the emergence of any future or potential rivals to American power, and to secure access to vital resources, especially Persian Gulf oil. William Out of power during the Clinton presidency, Wolfowitz and his colleagues affiliated themselves with a number of influential conservative think tanks. In 2000, they would craft yet another proposed national security strategy. This one published by a right-wing think tank, calling itself the Project for the New American Century. At its core, the document revived the Wolfowitz Doctrine. It called on the United States to increase the military budget by up to a hundred billion dollars, to deny other nations the use of outer space, and to adopt a more aggressive and unilateral foreign policy that would allow the United States to act offensively and preemptively in the world. The elimination of states like Iraq figured prominently in this grand vision. But even these hardline conservatives knew that the Wolfowitz Doctrine was likely too radical to win the support of the foreign policy establishment, their own Republican Party, and the American people. In their defining document, written in September of 2000, a full year before 9-11, they acknowledged that the process of transformation, even if it brings revolutionary change, is likely to be a long one. Absent in their own chilling words, some catastrophic and catalyzing event, like a new Pearl Harbor. One year later, that event would arrive. As if their funding was not suspicious enough, a number of hijackers reportedly trained at U.S. military bases. As hard as this is to believe that two of the alleged terrorists involved in what happened on Tuesday may have attended schools run by the U.S. military. Now this is according to a senior defense official. Ahmed al-Nami, Ahmed al-Gandhi, and Saeed al-Gandhi listed their address on both driver's licenses and car registrations as the Naval Air Station in Pensacola, Florida. Muhammad Adam reportedly graduated from the U.S. International Office School at Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama. In response to a Freedom of Information Act, Captain Jason Taylor confirmed that a Muhammad Adam trained there between 1998 and 1999, but did not verify if it was the same person. Abdulaziz Alamari attended Brooks Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas. Saeed Al-Gandhi and others attended the Defense Language Institute in Monterey, California, as confirmed by Lieutenant Colonel Steve Butler, Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs. American media ceases investigation when the Air Force says, we are probably not talking about the same people. Two of the hijackers, Nawaf Al-Hazmi 
and Khalid Almadar rented an apartment from and lived with an FBI informant. Curiously, a number of them were reported to still be alive after the attack.